It's truly an honor to be presenting with such a distinguished complement of panelists. And again, thank you very much for the kind, kind invitation. Events like this one enrich our collective understanding of corporate governance and financial regulation. Just as you will take away insights as a policymaker, I too benefit from hearing the views and perspectives that permeate and inform the views that others will be sharing. Given the question that focuses this gathering, what have we learned? I could have talked about almost anything. Ultimately, I decided to focus on two topics. The implementation of Dodd-Frank and the role of board directors in corporate decision making. Although my perspective is that of an SEC commissioner, these topics are not relevant only to the US discussion of financial regulatory reform, but are important dimensions of the global dialogue. In ways that I hope are apparent, my remarks this evening link to the thoughtful comments that others are sharing. Before I say more, as is customary for members of the SEC such as myself, I want to let you know that the views I express here today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Securities and Exchange Commission <laughs> or my fellow commissioners. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act has realigned the relationship between the government and the private sector in the United States. I will not flesh out this claim in detail, but instead will only suggest my reasoning by mentioning a few categories of rulemakings that Dodd-Frank directs the Securities and Exchange Commission to undertake. Among the scores, literally scores, of Dodd-Frank-related rulemakings that fall within the Commission's jurisdiction, not to mention the numerous studies that Dodd-Frank instructs the agency to conduct, are regulatory initiatives concerning swaps, securitization, the Volcker Rule, credit rating agencies, private funds, and corporate governance. The chairman of the SEC also is a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, a new systemic risk regulator that Dodd-Frank empowers with extensive authority to regulate financial companies in the name of protecting the financial system against identified threats. The Commission's regulatory responsibilities under Dodd-Frank follow in the wake of what already has been an active period for the agency. Since the financial crisis, the SEC has advanced a number of non-Dodd-Frank related initiatives concerning matters such as short selling, the election of board members, public company compensation and governance disclosures, money market funds, credit rating agencies, municipal securities, the custody of advisory client assets, asset-backed securities, mutual fund fees, broker-dealer risk management controls, and dark pools. Two concept releases that the Commission put forth this year, one regarding equity market structure and the other regarding the U.S. shareholder voting system, suggest still other topics that are receiving attention. One also could add to the mix the May 6 flash crash when the markets fell precipitously before rebounding rapidly. There is much that could be said about the particulars of the regulatory reform agenda. But for now, let me speak more generally, offering the following overarching thought. The extent to which the recent wave of federal government regulation in the United States already has displaced and distorted private sector decision making in our economy concerns me. And I am troubled by the potential that future regulatory initiatives, notably the regulations implementing Dodd-Frank, will go too far, unduly burdening the financial system at the expense of economic growth. Dodd-Frank charges the SEC with extensive rulemaking that allows the Commission a great deal of choice and discretion to shape the legislation's practical contours and thus to determine Dodd-Frank's ultimate impact. Without question, there is a fundamental role for government, including the SEC, in overseeing our financial system and our economy more generally. And regulatory reform affords us the chance to fashion a regulatory framework that is resilient and that fits our increasingly interconnected and complex financial system. Yet even as we share the common goal of mitigating the prospect of a future financial crisis and look to fend off the hardship that such a crisis would spawn, we have to recognize the real life cost to society if the regulations implementing Dodd-Frank excessively constrain and hamper the US financial system. 
as we strive to further secure the financial system and protect investors and others from misfortune. We need to be mindful that, as the regulatory regime becomes increasingly restrictive, financing may be more costly for companies and individuals to come by, <coughs> the ability of businesses and investors to manage their risks appropriately may be compromised, fewer valuable investment opportunities that would create wealth and income for investors may become available, and the commercialization of new ideas may be frustrated. Put differently, as the U.S. regulatory regime becomes more confining and rigid, all of us are impacted, non-financial companies, entrepreneurs, consumers, employees, and investors. If financial firms lose the flexibility they need to provide the full range of products, transactions, capital raising techniques, and services that drive our economy. New regulatory structures that end up burdening the economy in these ways come at the expense of private sector innovation, entrepreneurism, and competition, which is to say, U.S. economic growth. This builds to a straightforward but important point. That is, we need to use the regulatory authority Dodd-Frank has conferred upon us cautiously, carefully evaluating the intended benefits of our actions while giving due regard to the potential undesirable consequences of our regulatory steps. This should include assessing the cumulative impact of the entire package of new regulatory demands to anticipate the overall effect of the regulatory regime when viewed as a combined whole. It also should include ensuring that the U.S. regulatory regime is appropriately predictable. Private sector transacting and enterprise, including business investment and capital formation, are frustrated when regulatory frameworks become unpredictable. This is so whether the uncertainty is because a doctrine or a rule is applied inconsistently or because a doctrine or rule is expected to change but in an unknown way. Parties need to know what the rules of the road are and have well-founded confidence that the rules are not shifting beneath their feet. Throughout the financial crisis itself, there was a great deal of uncertainty as to how the law would be applied and as to the nature and extent of the U.S. government's potential intervention. To me, all of this means that we must approach our regulatory responsibilities with humility, appreciating the complexity of the challenges before us to ensure that we succeed in striking appropriate balances when we exercise the choice and discretion Dodd-Frank entrusts to us as U.S. regulators. What does such humility imply in practice, though, for a regulator such as myself? I have three practical suggestions. First, it is important to solicit, as the SEC has, especially when it comes to the implementation of Dodd-Frank, the full range of ideas and perspectives that interested parties have to offer. For we are better equipped as regulators to make informed decisions when we receive input from those on the ground who would be impacted by the regulatory change. With this input, we can evaluate more critically the practical consequences and trade-offs of choosing one regulatory course over another. Similarly, the detailed input we receive allows us to refine our regulations, tailoring the regulatory regime to fit the particular cost-benefit analyses that attach to different facts and circumstances. Second, regulatory decision-making should be supported by data to the extent available and rigorous economic analysis. The report prepared by the SEC and CFTC staffs on the May 6 flash crash exemplifies how the careful study of data can and should guide us as regulators. Not only does empirical analysis allow the SEC to leverage its expertise, but data and economics often reveal insights, many of which are counterintuitive, that we might not have appreciated otherwise and that allow us to challenge in fruitful ways our presuppositions and inclinations. For example, new insights can inform the agency's rulemaking agenda by highlighting unidentified areas of concern or, alternatively, assuaging suspicions that otherwise might have prompted regulation. Economic studies, whether they are empirical or theoretical, also can assist in revealing the potential impact of regulatory change over time as parties act and react dynamically before the marketplace reaches equilibrium. In short, data and economics have a way of disciplining decision-making so that we make better, more informed choices in discharging our regulatory duties. Third, in some instances, 
the SEC should exercise the choice and discretion we are permitted under Dodd-Frank to fashion a more incremental approach to regulatory reform in contrast to initiating a more, a more far-reaching set of regulations. Proceeding with such caution, namely, taking some regulatory steps now while deferring others until we can assess how the market, how the private sector has adjusted, allows for a more efficient and better calibrated regulatory regime to develop over time, having been grounded in the learning of experience and our consideration of the market's adaptations. An appreciable measure of regulatory restraint as manifested in a regulatory structure that is appropriately flexible in accommodating innovation and the forces of competition can be particularly prudent when regulators are exercising new authority and the impact on private sector conduct and marketplace dynamics of extending the regulatory regime is highly contingent and indeterminate. The new regulatory framework the SEC must fashion for security-based swaps comes to mind. Regulating, in essence, is about determining what conduct we are going to permit, what conduct we are going to prohibit, and what conduct we are going to mandate. Accordingly, like my colleagues around the globe, as a regulator, I'm in the business of drawing lines. As you can imagine, it can be difficult to identify the appropriate demarcations. In fact, people often disagree on where the lines should be drawn. By way of illustration, very recently, the SEC moved forward two rulemakings. The first rule proposal concerns the due diligence that issuers must perform when offering asset-backed securities. The second proposal concerns new, re new regulations for the swaps market. If you were to take the time to consider the issues each release explores, you would readily appreciate the complexity of the issues before us and the difficulty of drawing the lines that will determine the contours of the U.S. securities laws. Stated more generally, regulators have to make decisions under tight time pressures and with imperfect information. We are unable to predict the future with certainty. More to the point, every regulatory step we take or decide not to take has both costs and benefits associated with it. Even mandatory disclosure, which is the core of U.S. securities regulation, is not costless notwithstanding the considerable benefits that flow from transparency. At each turn, the practical question then is this, do the benefits of some regulatory course outweigh the costs or not? This is all by way of underscoring that regulators need to act with humility as we attempt to strike what we think are the appropriate balances among diverse interests given our understanding of the trade-offs. We need to guard against being overconfident that we have crafted well-calibrated regulatory regimes that will do more good than harm. We must appreciate that there are limits to what we can and should expect from government. Across jurisdictions, boards of directors are central to good corporate governance. Not only do directors help ensure regulatory compliance, but they shape corporate strategy and help chart its execution and have a key role in risk management. Let me therefore turn to what I think is the bottom line question that directors and their advisors have to ask. The question is simple. What makes for an effective board of directors? In the US and elsewhere, the evaluation of boards routinely focuses on board composition and structure and the frequency of meetings. How many independent directors does a board have? What constitutes independence? Is the chairman of the board independent? If the chairman is not independent, is there an independent lead director? Are board elections competitive? What committees has the board constituted? How often does the board meet? What is the board's practice regarding independent directors meeting separately? How do the skills, experiences, and qualifications of the directors blend? These are all appropriate inquiries, but what matters most is not how a board is composed or structured or how many meetings are held each year. What matters most is how directors act. As I view US corporations, Boards of directors are expected to improve corporate decision making by spurring deliberation. In acting as a body, the promise is that boards will draw on the distinct perspectives, experiences, sensibilities, and expertise that different directors offer. The expectation is that as the group works through a range of ideas and arguments, the decision that is made will be better as a result of the director's collective efforts. 
As decision making improves, so should the company's competitiveness and its ultimate performance. The active engagement of directors is the linchpin of meaningful deliberation. Decision making should improve when directors, whether interacting with each other or with management, engage in open and frank discussions, even if it means being critical. When assessing some course of action, directors should ask probing questions and follow-ups of each other and of management, should challenge key assumptions, should offer competing analyses, and should develop competing options to ensure that alternatives are considered and not cast aside too readily. Put differently, and so far as my view of U.S. companies is concerned, directors should be willing to dissent, and disagreement from others should not be discouraged or suppressed. When it leads people to engage rigorously, disagreement helps ensure that the unknown is identified, that potential costs are spotted, that conflicts are as well spotted, that information is uncovered, that biases are managed, and that challenges and opportunities are assessed in a more balanced way. Indeed, a board may want to consider designating one or two directors, perhaps on a rotating basis, whose express charge is to be skeptical and to press when needed. Peter Drucker, the influential management consultant and professor, expressed a similar sentiment this way. Decisions of the kind the executive has to make are not made well by acclamation. They are made well only if based on the clash of conflicting views, the dialogue between different points of view, the choice between different judgments. The first rule in decision making is that one does not make a decision unless there is disagreement." End quote. There is a word of caution, however. Disagreement and spirited deliberation should not give way to hostility. Distrust and disharmony can threaten an enterprise. Boards need collegiality and cooperation and a well-functioning relationship with management. Dissent will be most constructive then when conflicting viewpoints and pointed resistance do not trigger defensiveness, but instead are encouraged as catalyzing better decisions that benefit the corporation and its stakeholders. Since I joined the SEC in the summer of 2008, the SEC has had to confront difficult challenges. We have not been alone. Many countries have faced the strains of financial crisis, and regulators throughout the international community have been forced to make hard decisions in trying to arrest the crisis and restore economic growth. Accordingly, I want to conclude by recognizing the cooperative spirit with which policymakers around the globe have committed themselves to addressing the causes and consequences of the turmoil. Of the many lessons to learn from the financial crisis, one is particularly appropriate for this gathering. Simply put, the world is extremely interconnected, and perhaps to a degree and in ways that were not fully appreciated. Global capital markets with global consequences recommend enhanced global cooperation. I trust that we can and will build on the new relationships that have been established and the long-standing friendships that have been strengthened as we continue shaping the new financial regulatory regime. For me, a corollary to cooperation is to recognize that we in the United States do not have a monopoly on good ideas. As the SEC continues to struggle with complex matters, we must give due attention to the views of our fellow securities regulators abroad who may have grappled with similar issues and adopted approaches from which we can learn. There is value in looking to other jurisdictions to assess their responses to common regulatory challenges and opportunities. Of course, as regulators cooperate and learn from each other, it must be stressed that even if something works in one country, it may not work in another. Given the complexities of crafting a regulatory regime, no two countries' financial regulatory systems will be mere images. In fact, one would expect diverse countries with unique economies, political structures, cultures, and histories to approach financial regulation differently, even as we share the common ends of ensuring the integrity of our financial markets, protecting investors, mitigating systemic risk, and facilitating access to capital. There is much, much more that could be said. For now, though, I'll simply end by saying what an honor it is to serve at the SEC, especially during such a historic period. I continue to be humbled by the chance that I've been given to contribute what I can 
to advancing the public interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Paredes.